I was born and raised in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri, in a working class family with little formal education. Not only that, uh, people in my family were attracted to fundamentalist Pentecostal religion. And so uh, if you thought we were hillbillies, I'll add we were holy rollers too. <laughs> and both those cultures are ones in which sexuality is a topic that you just almost never uh, can discuss at all. And so you might not predict that I'd become a neuroscientist who studies sexual behavior and sexuality. But in fact, there were several things about my upbringing that sort of steered me along this way. First, uh, I spent my early childhood on my grandparents' scraggly 40-acre farm, which is a great place to get a sex education. <laughs> Before I was in school, I asked my grandmother, where did the calves come from? And she explained it to me, very straightforward, easy to understand language. She said, when the time comes, the cow goes out into the field and turns over rocks until she finds one with a calf curled under it. <laughs> Okay, seemed plausible to me. God knows we have plenty of rocks in the Ozarks, so... Uh, but the thing that hung me up was, I know the cows, they only move their hooves in this direction. You know, they, they don't do much of this sort of thing. And as I was trying to figure out how the cow could do that, and, and it puzzled me. Well, all got cleared up by and by. When I was in first grade, one morning I went with my grandmother to let the cows out of the barn for the day. And when we opened one stall, here's this tableau in front of us. In the back left part of the stall, the cow is lying down completely on her side. And from her hind end, there is this slimy, blood-streaked trail leading to the front of the stall on the right. And standing there, wobbly-legged, is a calf, still wet, blinking at the first two humans it's ever laid eyes on. Now, in my mind, I was thinking the first grade equivalent of, these data do not fit the prevailing paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> and I pointed to the cow's rear end. I said, Grandma, did the calf come from there? And after about half a beat, she said, no. <laughs> so I knew she was lying to me, and I had no idea why. So here was my first important lesson about sexuality. This is a topic about which humans are totally irrational. <laughs> And I've often thought that that was the beginning of my life as a scientist because, you know, I, I loved, respected, and, and completely admired her, and yet she was not a reliable source of information. <laughs> and, and I think that's when I really started thinking. I had to, you know, decide things for myself. And from that day to this, I have a very hard time accepting anything is true just because someone told me or just because I read it somewhere, which is an excellent uh, attitude to be a scientist. Um, uh, mind you, it doesn't make me a particularly pleasant friend or spouse because <laughs> for some reason people get upset if you don't believe anything they tell you. I found out about sexual orientation and homophobia a little later when I was in sixth grade. My older California cousins had taught me a, a really funny new word, queer. And its real meaning, of course, went completely over my head. I thought it meant a person who was especially strange or odd. And, uh, and so I, and I thought it was funny. So one night, I'm feeding my baby brother Todd. He's in his high chair. I'm feeding him while my mother's preparing dinner. And I say something to him like, uh, Oh, Todd, I, I bet you wish that queer would stop giving you carrots. And my mother says real sharply, Don't say that. And I'm not even sure she's talking to me. Is that my little sisters and the other? I mean, and pretty soon I say something else like, Oh, Todd, I bet you really wish that queer would give you some applesauce instead. Well, my mother teleported from the sink <laughs> to the table, must have, because suddenly my face was slapped and she said, she said, I told you not to use that word. Now, the slap didn't hurt much. But you have to understand, this was the first time my mother had ever laid a hand on me, and it turns out it would be the last as well. And so I was in total shock, and it was clear I couldn't even ask her what was wrong with that word, right? It'd be a couple of years before I'd find out. And I have to wonder, you know, did my mother, was she worried, given her upbringing, and was she worried that her oldest child, this, you know, slight, bookish, an incredibly unathletic boy, um, <laughs> might he get contaminated just by being exposed to the concept and be led down a, a pathway that she thought uh, led to perdition? Well, fast forward 37 years, and I've been a professor at UC Berkeley for over a decade already, 
And my neuroscience career has centered on sex differences in the structure of the brain and spinal cord in rats, mice, hamsters, that sort of thing. And it turns out there's lots of different parts of the brains in those animals that are structurally different, where you can reliably know that that area will be larger in this sex or will have more neurons in that sex, that sort of thing. And what they all have in common is a relatively simple rule, which is I can make the animal's brain as masculine or feminine as I want just by controlling exposure to testosterone. If I give the animals testosterone at the right time of life, typically around the time of birth, then when it grows up, it'll have a masculine brain. And if I insulate the animal from testosterone early in life, when it grows up, it'll have a feminine brain. And my neuroscience career has consisted of doing experiments trying to track this down. Where does the hormone go? What does it do to the cells there? How do the cells change? And how does that affect the animal's behavior? And, and you know, I'm having such a great time working on all these little puzzles that I never really gave much thought to whether it had anything to do with people. I wasn't concerned about it. And in fact, if you had asked me then, why is it that, you know, 96% of people or so are straight? I would have told you, you don't have to look any further than our society. Look how we all grow up under the constant attention of the gender police, including my mother, probably yours, and everything about our society is so heteronormative, right? Think of all those Disney movies, each one of which has got a straight couple at the core of it, right? And so there's no need to think about testosterone for people. Well, then one afternoon in my office, I read this paper that says that in humans, there's a sex difference in the structure of the hand that is present in two-year-old children. Now, I've spent my entire adult life so far studying sex differences. I never heard of this, what? And it turns out that if you measure the length of the index finger, digit two, and, and then measure the length of the ring finger, digit four, you can make a ratio, the length of D2 divided by the length of D4, and on average, that's bigger in females than it is in males. And I knew enough about sex differences to know if the sex difference is present already at two years of age, almost certainly it's there because the boys got exposed to more testosterone before birth than the girls did. And so it's, wow. So this could be a retrospective marker that tells me approximately how much testosterone a person was exposed to to 20, 92 years ago when they were in their mother's womb. Well, I'm living in the San Francisco Bay Area where we have almost as many gay people as there are rocks in the Ozarks. <laughs> so, so let's test some hypotheses. So we started going to street fairs that fall, asking people, please can we Xerox your hands and uh, will you answer these questions we have about what gender people you like to have sex with, what gender people do you fantasize about, etc. Et cetera. Now, you might have thought this would be a difficult experiment to do, it'd be hard to get subjects. But in fact, this was the easiest experiment I had ever done. <laughs> because we got over 700 people to answer all those questions by offering them a $1 lottery scratcher ticket. <laughs> people will tell you anything for a $1 lottery scratcher ticket. Which is especially funny because if you do the math, they're worth about 49 cents, right? And, and, and so this was also the cheapest experiment I'd ever done to, uh, up to that point, because it'll cost you a lot more than a dollar to get any information from a rat, trust me. <laughs> so we do this study, and we gather the data, and the first question is, was it true about the, about the digit? And yes, indeed, on the right hand only, we didn't see it in the left hand, there, there was a sex difference. That ratio, D2 to A, would tend to be larger uh, in women than in men. And then we asked, what about gay versus straight men? And we saw absolutely no difference between them. So there was no evidence that gay men had seen less testosterone before birth than straight men. And to this day, I don't know of any convincing evidence that gay men saw less prenatal testosterone than straight men. Although it's interesting that people really want to believe that that might be the case. I just don't know any data to support that. On the other hand, when we compared our women, Sure enough, the women who told us they were lesbians, on average, they had a more masculine digit ratio than the women who told us they were straight. And I don't know how to explain that, except to say that the lesbians, on average, must have seen a little more prenatal testosterone than the straight women. And I don't know how to explain that, except to say that if you're a female and you see a little more testosterone before birth, when you grow up, you're more likely to find women attractive. 
Which, by the way, suggests that, well, maybe the reason 96% of men are attracted to women is because of the testosterone they saw before birth. Well, we write up the, the results, submit it to nature, it gets a lot of attention, and you cannot imagine how much guff I got about this paper. First, there was the homophobic fringe. People, strangers, would email, write, phone me to say, I know you're lying. You're gay, and you're making this stuff up to justify <laughs> your choice of a sinful lifestyle, that sort of thing. And even among scientists, I think, I think a lot of my colleagues have had a hard time imagining that you could find out anything important when you, found, when you made the measures with a 99-cent ruler, right? No, no cyclotron required. And, and others of my colleagues, other scientists, on the basis of no data whatsoever, declared that this was just a fluke. It was, it was empty cocktail party banter, and it would never be replicated. Well, over the next six years, every calendar year, there was at least one published replication of, the, of the, our effect. And eventually someone did a meta-analysis that, that confirmed it, and then people compared twins, and that confirmed it, and, it, and, and there have been several other publications. And so, I'm sorry. It's a fact, get used to it. Lesbians have a more masculine digit ratio than straight women do, okay? Now, having said that, uh, there's a misunderstanding about our results that I want to warn you about. And when I was talking about the, the hands, I noticed several of you taking a peek at your hands. <laughs> and then there's a little line showing right here. I'm getting a little bit worried, right? There's, there's one gentleman, I think, I think he's convinced that he's a lesbian. <laughs> Stay calm. No, no need for an identity crisis here. You need to understand that because they only roughly reflect prenatal testosterone, you can't tell anything about a given person by looking at their, at their hands, right? And, and there's, a, there's a joke I, I like to tell to sort of get this across. So if you want, I'm going to teach everyone here how to take a random sample of people, and by looking at their right hand, you're going to be able to guess their sexual orientation, and you're going to almost always be right. You want me to teach you how to do that? Yes. Yeah, good, good. So, uh, get your random sample of people, look at the right hand, and look at your right hand now, right? And for each person, when you, when you look at them, pay very careful attention to whether this digit is longer or this digit is longer. And whatever you see, guess straight. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be right about 95, 96% of the time. If it was a random sample. So you see, it's not, it's not a tell, it's not a shibboleth, it's not some secret way of knowing someone's sexual orientation. And we don't need a secret way to know someone's sexual orientation, right? We know how to do that. You ask them. You make sure they feel safe. And, and that's how you know. Well, there's a personal aspect to the story that we didn't include in nature. So uh, I, I knew uh, that we'd get a lot of scrutiny for this sort of thing, so I, I measured all those fingers myself and, and crunched all the data myself in the course of a long weekend when it happened that my wife and kids were visiting my in-laws in Vermont. So that, so that late Sunday afternoon, I finally get down to these things that I've been telling you. And it's one of those beautiful moments that all scientists live for. We don't get nearly enough of them where I realized, just for a while, that right now, I just found out something that no one in the universe has ever known. And it's really a terrific feeling. And I was just savoring it when the phone rang. And it was my mother who tended to call on Sunday evenings in those days. Now, my mother was still in the Ozarks, but of course, she had been on a journey, too. After she retired, she, for a while, became a quasi-den mother to a group of young adults, including several people who were gay and who had been thrown out of their families because of it. And even though she had been taught that they were sinful people with reprobate minds and all that sort of thing, she still got to know them, and she was talking to them and listening to what they were saying to her. And it started to change how she was interpreting her Bible, to the extent that she's still going to a fundamentalist Pentecostal church, but now she's arguing with the preacher in church about whether homosexuality is a sin. She doesn't believe that. And uh, it, 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 it must have been funny. My, my mother, the ninth grade, knockout, knock, ninth grade dropout, telling the guy with theology degrees, you don't understand the Bible, right? I, I would have loved to have been there. 
And, and by the way, you need to understand that my mother adored her pastor, Brother Frank, and his wife, Nancy. And a few years later, I would ask him to officiate at her funeral, and it was clear that he absolutely loved her too. Uh, but they remained at loggerheads on this issue. You know, they'd each tell the other they were wrong, and then both of them would laugh. So uh, that Sunday night, I'm telling her about these results and what they mean. She has no difficulty understanding it at all. And what does she say? She says, well, I know people are born that way. This was a few years before anyone had heard of Lady Gaga. She didn't steal her life. <laughs> and, and she said, how could it be a sin when God made them the way they are? So after we hung up that night, I remembered our dispute about the word queer years ago. And, and you can't imagine how fulfilling it felt to realize that the second person in the universe to know about our findings was my mother. And it was great to know that we were on the same page about this, that, that same-sex love wasn't immoral, and it wasn't a matter of choice. Right? I'd gotten there my nerdy, sciencey way, you know, the hypotheses and measures and statistics, all that good stuff. While my mother had gotten there simply by following her heart. Thank you. Wow.